marketing in a mobile only world with jonathan hosson digital marketing expert this is v coach bong de Ungria serving you another educational video as a background this is part of an actual class at the Ateneo Graduate School of Business in January 2019. So this is a live Zoom recording and interaction with subject matter expert, Jonathan Hosson. This on the computer. So again, Jonathan, um, welcome to digital marketing class in Ateneo. Um, it's purely online. If you remember the one you had before, uh, we were present in one. In person. But here, yes, yes. everybody's online. So welcome, welcome, and thanks for accepting our invite for today. Of course, Bong. Uh, always happy to share my experience, especially in an academic setting. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me again. Okay. Yeah. Okay, should I start? Yes. Okay, so, good. so um, I only have a very short period of time. Uh, so my request is, Let's condense and maybe curate all the questions to the Q&A period at the end of the session, if that's possible. Okay, and uh, for now, um, para, so it's easier. Can you mute all your mics? They're better, so we, there's no background noise. Okay, so let me start. So it's actually uh, very, um, what I'm presenting today is a presentation I've given several times. No? It's called Marketing in a Mobile First World. Uh, I presented this to quite a few big companies already, you know, including uh, GMA, ABS-CBN, uh, a few big advertising agencies, and so on. And uh, it's really a long talk. It's usually two, one and a half to two hours long, but I'm going to try to condense it to 20 minutes you know, by removing all the irrelevant examples. You know? uh, but when I share the deck with you, so I'll be sharing the actual Google Slides deck with you guys, there will be some videos there that... Um, um, will have examples now so you can play it within the deck itself okay so i won't cover these today just because i'm not sure how the videos will play um in in meet and zoom and i'm not sure if we have enough time now so without further ado let me let me proceed so maybe a quick intro about me um i've been doing digital marketing for around 11 years now of which my first eight years were spent uh working in different ad agencies so i don't know how many of you remember yehey.com uh yehey was one of the very first digital agencies in the Philippines. No? But uh, it, it really started out as Yehey.com, the search engine. No? It was literally a uh, garage company set up by a couple of people with a server who wanted to make a local Yahoo. No? But eventually it got acquired by another company and they transformed it into a digital agency uh, led by the then CEO, Donald Lim. Now, Donald Lim eventually became um, heads of Macan of uh, ABS-CBN Digital, and uh, now he's a, a chairman or CEO of Densu, so one of the biggest agencies, um, agency group in the Philippines. Uh, after that, I, I went through several agencies. Uh, I was uh, employee number three of Media Contacts, which eventually became Habas. Habas is one of the biggest European uh, ad networks in, in, in the world. Then I, I did a two-year stint in Hong Kong for a company called Red Fuse Communications. Now, it's not widely known, widely known in the Philippines, but it's actually the agency of Colgate Palmolive. So I was handling nine markets uh, across Asia, from China to India, to uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Philippines, Thailand, and so on. You know? uh, but eventually, I got tired of the agency life, and I felt that I needed to do something more. So I went back, and I actually, uh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping now. I uh, went back and joined Google in 2015. Okay? So let me, let me, uh, Rewind a bit, you know, just to show you, give you some context of what I've done. No? Uh, but So I've been in, in the industry since 2007. And um, in the ad agency industry, there's always a big uh, annual event called Ad Congress. I'm not sure if you've been to Ad Congress before. Uh, nowadays, it's, it's now split into two. You know? There's the Ad Summit and there's uh, Digicon. You know? But the recurring theme of every ad congress I've joined since 2010 to 2015 is every year people announce that, hey, it's the year of mobile. No? So 2009 uh, pa lang, uh, back when we were using Blackberries and uh, Nokia phones, no? people were announcing that uh, this year is going to be the year of mobile. And if you look at uh, all the reviews no, from, from if, you, if you just Google year of mobile, since 2010 all the way to 2015, 
people have been saying mar- marketers should shift their budgets to mobile. It's the year of mobile and so on and so forth. No? Uh, and up to now, I still encounter some resistance from marketers saying, okay, mobile isn't relevant. Right? Uh, the bad news for these people is it's actually come and gone. No? Mobile is now the most preferred way of accessing the internet, bar none. If you're not doing mobile marketing, then you're not doing marketing at all, is what I have to say. And I'll, I'll talk more about this in the next 20 minutes. Okay? Uh, going back to some background, so I've handled several brands. Um, I really spent a lot of time with Unilever brands, in particular um, Sunsilk, uh, Close Up, and so on. But I also started doing campaigns for Citibank. You know? So Citibank is where I really honed my craft. What I do is called performance marketing. Performance marketing means doing digital marketing in order to get uh, some sort of result, whether it's sales or leads or what have you. Okay? Um, I picked up a couple of awards on the way, but recently I went viral for talking about millennials. So something completely different, but uh, I think that really gave me a break in terms of uh, being able to do something else aside from what I do. Okay? So as I said, I joined Google in 2015. Uh, where I handled something called performance marketing, which I kind of described a while ago. But uh, in a nutshell, what it is, is uh, helping people who want to book flights or to get a credit card or get a loan, discover my advertiser. So I was actually working with uh, Cebu Pacific as my biggest client, um, with um, Philippine Airlines, with BDO, with BPI, and so on. So badly put, if you search for flight to Singapore or flight to Cebu or flight to Manila, or search for best credit card, I would help these companies um, showcase their products. I'll get to that in a bit. Okay? Sorry, do you hear the notification? That's from my end. So I think it's shared. Sorry about that. Okay? Next up, um, I left Google in 2016. So I focus now uh, completely on two things. So I have two businesses, uh, completely online and e-commerce. One of this is Hair Manila. So I don't have any hair. Uh, but my wife owns a salon. And we eventually discovered that um, people from all over the Philippines, specifically from Mindanao uh, and from North Luzon and some parts of Visayas, actually need um, premium hair care products. You know? So Kerastas, L'Oreal Professional, and so on. And these weren't widely distributed on retail. So we found out a big opportunity in terms of actually selling e-commerce uh, premium hair care. And it's not cheap. No? These are shampoos from 700 above all the way to some SKUs which are 5,000 to 6,000 pesos. Okay? Um, Jonathan, There's a huge market for it. Yes. Yeah, Jonathan, um, uh, since this is being recorded, actually, yes. um, can you minimize the pictures on the right side so we can see? What, the, what pictures? Uh, you don't see any. You don't see any. any oh, you mean the, the videos? Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Sure. Then, I, I think you can move the that small box or something to, to okay move, uh, okay I'll move it here on the upper left or upper lower left there yeah okay okay yeah, thank you hey, sure so that's this is one one business that I uh, own uh, most of but the other one is also e-commerce it's called boozy.ph no? so we deliver premium liquor so whiskey wine spears etc on demand in Metro Manila. So what that means is we get it for, to you in 60 to 90 minutes, as well as nationwide. But we don't do on-demand in Cebu and, and most of this yet. No? So that's coming this year. So uh, aside from that, as, as Bong mentioned, I also do consulting, but not as much as my two businesses. Da. Okay? So that's enough about me. Uh, that's really the context of where I'm coming from. And it's really going to be talking about uh, mobile marketing and mobile uh, from the point of view of two things. No? Number one is media, which is my specialty, and also e-commerce, which is now my, my, my new focus uh, in terms of my businesses. Okay? So first thing I'd like to talk about is that things are changing very quickly. Uh, the common sin of um, most marketers is that their noses are too close to the ground. And they think uh, very insular. No? So they're only really worried about things that matter to their brand. But what they don't realize is that consumers are changing much more quickly than they think. Okay? Here's an example. So in the year 2000, if you remember what Google, the search engine, looked like back then, no? it looked like this. If you remember a desktop computer with a big monitor, and uh, if you search for something, you just see a list of different links leading to websites that mention the keyword that you search for, right? 
and most of them users of, of Google back then lived in developed countries like uh, the US, uh, Canada, and most of Western Europe. If you now look 15 years later, you know, if you look at how Google is now, and, and this is just three years ago, four years ago, uh, it's now much more than a list of links. If you search for the word Aldab, for example, you'll see news, you'll see photos, you'll see videos on YouTube, you'll see different things, not just websites, that matter to the keyword that you search for. And more importantly, two of three users of Google now come from developing countries like the Philippines or Indonesia or those in Africa, right? And these users are more and more, or mostly up to now, mobile users. So if you look at the number of searches being conducted in Google every year, there are trillions of them. And over half of those actually happen on mobile already. Uh, and this was four years ago almost, April 2015. And uh, if you look at um, that data now, it could be 60% already. Okay. Here's a graph I usually show. Uh, if, you, if you try to remember when you first accessed the internet, no? for me it was 1996. Uh, if you look at 1994, which is over here, you'll notice that they were probably around like 100 million, 200 million internet users back then. But if you go fast forward to 2014, that few hundred million grew to 3 billion users. No, it's, it's half the, almost half the world's population. Okay? But from 2014 to 2020, which is next year, no, there will be 2 billion new internet users coming online for the first time. Okay? That's a mind-blowing fact. No? It took 20 years to get from a few hundred million to 3 billion, but it will only take 6 more years to grow another 2 billion. Now, these are people who have never bought anything online, never taken an Uber or a Grab, uh, have never done a Google search or watched a YouTube video. No, so imagine how the internet could change these people's lives in a very short period of time. No, so like for, for me, I remember uh, starting out with dial-up and eventually having DSL. Then now I have fiber at home. No? It took 20 years. But imagine somebody in like, Myanmar who started out with... Um, like no internet connection at all, suddenly going to LTE or even 5G. So that's what we call leapfrogging. We see leapfrogging behavior in countries in Africa, in South America, and in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, for example, where people who have zero access suddenly have super, super fast access to all these different things that we've taken for granted. Okay? That's the opportunity for marketers. And for me, that's really the reason why I chose to focus on e-commerce. Okay? So zooming in on the Philippines, uh, why is the Philippines growing so fast in terms of internet connectivity? Number one is that millennials are now not kids. No, so I'm actually a zenial, uh, one of the first millennials who remember a time about the internet. Okay? I'm sure most of you are zenials or millennials too. Okay? Uh, we are now um, having families, buying cars, buying houses, traveling more, becoming managers in our, in our companies and so on. No? And uh, as millennials grow and more and more affluent, they also change the way that people buy. So millennials are used to having choice. What does that mean? Um, they, my parents, for example, when they wanted to fly somewhere, they only had Philippine Airlines. Me, if I want to go to Singapore or even Cebu, I have to take. I can take Air Asia. I can take um, uh, Cebu Pacific, Philippine Airlines, Scoot, and so on and so forth. Now, so many different choices. Same with taking on a bank loan. No, you can go BDO, BPI, Security Bank, and all the different banks. Okay? So uh, because they have the internet, uh, these, these millennials, this generation really is able to um, make choices in a much more informed way than the previous generations. Okay? Second is more affordable data plans. Um, biggest example is free Facebook. So the Philippines is the only country, uh, one of the only countries in the world, so there are three or five of them, where internet penetration is equal to Facebook penetration. Okay, why is that? Everybody with prepaid effectively has free Facebook. Yeah, as long as they have a smartphone. Which brings me to my third point, which is that the most important here is hardware. So globally, Google did a study where uh, they looked at what price point people would readily buy a smartphone and upgrade from a feature phone. And that price point is $20. In 2014, or 15, 
Google came out with a uh, sorry, um, Smart came out with a plan with my phone where you get a a cheap Android phone for only eight hundred pesos. No, so and I'm sure you can find cheaper than that if you go on you know, second hand sites, no, uh, second hand Samsung, second hand my phones and so on. And it becomes a no brainer where you upgrade from a BlackBerry or a feature phone to a smartphone. Okay. So uh, a few more stats. If you look at the bottom box with the red box here on this slide, uh, you'll see that the Philippines actually has a mobile population of 130 million, which is more than our population of 104 million. Okay. Why is that? People have multiple SIM cards. No? They could have a tablet and a phone or they could have a dual SIM phone or so on and so forth. Right? Secondly, if you look at our active mobile social users, it's 59 million people which is very, very close to our total internet users, which is 69 million. No? So what you'll see is that a vast majority of our internet users actually use mobile most of the time. Okay? So just to summarize uh, the past few slides and really demonstrate uh, the huge change in the past uh, 20 years. No? If in 1998, my parents would tell me, don't, don't get into strangers' cars no? and don't meet people from the internet, if you look at just two years ago, suddenly you have the boom of, of Grab and Uber, where you're literally summoning strangers from the internet to get into their car. No? And uh, it happened in just 20 years. No? That's the huge rate of change that we are experiencing in terms of technology. Okay, so why is that happening? And this is a, 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 a slide or video I like showing. It's because of that little device that you keep in your pocket. It's the first thing you pick up when you uh, wake up in the morning, and most likely it's the last thing you put down at night. Okay, you probably spend more time with it than anybody else, including your spouse or your significant other. And it's some a lot of things to you. It's a it's a email uh, device. It's a camera. It's an alarm clock. It's a flashlight. Uh, it's a wallet. Um, it's a heart rate monitor, and so many different things that um, are it's being used for. Right? It's your mobile phone. Okay. What I'd like to talk about now, and because of that intro, is that we should now be talking about marketing in a mobile-only world. Okay. Why, why the radical change? No? Why not just mobile first? It's because of this realization. No? The next generation of people going online for the first time will not be doing so on a laptop or a computer. They'll be doing it on a mobile device. Okay. And that's something that you really have to think about, uh, especially if you are used to a desktop. No? Uh, um, in the Philippines, maybe 70-80% of, of all internet traffic is now mobile. Okay? Let that sink in. 80% of all internet traffic, including video, is already mobile. Okay? That's a huge, huge, huge uh, thing to realize for most traditional marketers. Okay? Okay, so I'd like to show four or five points that uh, I'd like to, to uh, point out in order for you to rethink how we do mobile marketing. Okay, the first is we have to rethink how we do 360 marketing. Okay, so if you look back at how we were taught marketing in university, uh, there was always a, a huge push for 360 marketing. Okay, what is that? You have to be on TV with a huge weight. You have to get several uh, um, recognizable endorsers. You have to be on radio. You have to be on print. You have to be on out of home. You have to be uh, on location and so on. No? Why is that? Because we wanted to make sure that we could hit people with enough frequency. No? Meaning we show a message over and over and over again so that when they go to the shelf, no? and this is what, what's uh, called the uh, zero moment of truth. Uh, sorry, the first moment of truth by PNG. That's when you make a decision. Okay, I, I need shampoo. And the first thing that comes to mind is, let's say, Pantene. Because of that, uh, I'll pick Pantene off the shelf and put it in my basket. Okay? And that's the psychology behind uh, how 360 marketing was done for so long. Okay? Now, Google came up with a new way of thinking about uh, purchase behavior. And it's called moment-based marketing. And I'll, I'll show that here. Okay. It's a slide from Google. It's called, We're Living in a World of Moments. There's a video that comes with it, but because uh, I'm not sure if it's going to play, I won't, I won't play it now. But you can play it when you review the deck. 
Okay, so just uh, click on the YouTube link here. Okay, but what it basically says is this slide. No, when people use the internet, it's because they are doing or encountering a certain moment. Okay, what is that? Whether they are looking to be entertained. Let's say I'm I'm uh, stuck in waiting for the elevator in my building. No, and it's taking a while. I could read a quick Facebook or blog post, or I could read, let's say, or I could watch a video on YouTube. Okay, or let's say I'm uh, planning a trip to Greece on the second column here, and I want to know what to do in Greece, and I search for Greece tourism. Let's say later on I want to be able to book a trip to Greece, and suddenly you search for travel agents near you, and you see all these travel agencies come up in Google. Or let's say you're looking for things to do on your trip to Greece. No? Uh, you, think, you search for things to do in Greece. And lastly, when it's about to buy, you search for something like hotels in Greece. Okay? What the difference is now is that you don't have to be everywhere every time. No? With 360 marketing, uh, it was all about being everywhere every time. And you all just have to think of shampoo commercials or telcos. No? They're very good at being omnipresent anywhere you go. Okay? But the good news for brands now is that you only really have to be relevant at the time people are searching for you. Okay? For example, um, let's say Boozy.ph, one of my businesses. Uh, somebody's searching for liquor delivery. Okay? When they search for liquor delivery, I can guarantee in Metro Manila that my ad will come out. Okay? And that for me is super important because I only want to target people who are my customers. Yeah, I, I'm not San Miguel, I'm not uh, uh, Emperador, so I don't really care about making people aware about my brand. What's important to me though is when they search for the brands that I carry, let's say Johnny Walker or a Macallan Whiskey, I want to make sure that they land on my website. So I focus on those moments only. Okay? So I'll get back to that in a bit. No, and it actually helps if you watch the video. Actually, let's try playing the video. Bong, can you tell me if the video plays properly? All right, it's playing now. Can you hear it? Yes. So uh, that's a quick video. You can play it again uh, when I share the deck with you. But it really demonstrates um, why moments are so important. No? And it just harkens back to your experience as a customer. Most likely, you, you never made a decision just because you saw an ad several times. Most likely, you still had to research about it, no? which credit card is best for you, which car is best for you, and so on. And that's the moments where you want to come in with a message to say, hey, why don't you consider my company or my service? Okay. So moving on, next to the rethinking assets. Now, if a while ago it was re rethinking 360 marketing, now you want to re rethink assets. The most important part here is this. No? If you have a website, please make sure it's mobile friendly. Okay, so uh, uh, like 90% of the, the companies I talk to, when they build a website, the, the designer builds it so it's, it looks nice on a desktop. 
Okay? What they don't realize is that most people actually use it on a mobile phone. So just look at the BPI website, the old one. It's, it's, it's not upgraded yet. No? Uh, it's the, the new one is still on beta, which is this one. But if you look at the old site, if you go to BPI Express online, if you open it on the mobile phone on the right side, you have to zoom in and pinch with your screen. It is a very, very bad mobile experience. Second, if the links are very small, if your finger is big and your phone is small, if you click on loans, you may end up clicking on cards, okay? which again is very annoying. No? Uh, um, even more annoying, and it's a security bank, uh, if you have a form where people have to fill up things, you know, whether credit cards or, or uh, let's say, information to sign up for something, uh, my, my advice to you is to try to fill it up on a phone. It's so hard to fill up a form on a phone because the keyboard is so small. Okay, so this conversion rate is probably super low because it's designed for desktop but expected to be filled out on a mobile. Okay, so imagine you have to pinch and then type in um, all the forms here, like one, two, three. There are like 20 different fields here which you have to type in one by one on a small keyboard. No? So not a very good user experience. Okay. I have a video here. It's called uh, Progressive Web Apps. It's a technology that now allows um, websites and apps to load very quickly on your phone. Now, I won't cover this now because you don't have time, but um, please do research about this. No? It's a way of making a website load very quickly so that people will have a good user experience. No? So all I really want to talk about in this section is uh, just make sure that whatever you're building, whether a website or an app or, or even a Facebook page, no? all of them should look very, very good on a mobile device. Okay, because as I said earlier, 80% of all people will access it from a mobile device. Okay, next, rethink targeting. No? And I'm going to breeze through this quite quickly. Okay, I always get this. No? Why should I, this question, why should I even bother targeting mobile users? Okay? Most traditional marketers think, okay, especially in the travel industry, that people still buy on a computer. No, when they book a flight or when they book a hotel, um, most advertisers think that they only really browse on a mobile phone, but they end up converting with either on a travel agency or on a desktop uh, web to access a website like Cebu Pacific Air. No? I'd like to dispute that point. Okay? Uh, this is a screenshot of the Google Analytics from hairmanela.com, hairmanela.com, where you can see that 80%, no, 78% on the left side of all sessions actually come from mobile. Okay? If you look at number of transactions and even revenue, okay, it goes down a bit, but it's still majority. No? 65% of all transactions on my website happen from mobile. 675 of all revenue happens on mobile. No? So mobile users are extremely valuable. Especially if you now go to iPhones. No? So this is the same uh, data as this slide, the previous slide, but focusing on what brand of phone they're using. Now, Apple devices, Apple phones, account for 39% of all traffic. But if you look at revenue, Apple devices account for 67.1% and 70% of all transactions and revenue respectively. Okay? So why is that? Uh, iPhone users are usually more affluent and they usually have credit cards, no? which makes them uh, much more attractive targets for e-commerce. Okay? So our, there are several ad formats that are mobile specific. No? One of them is on Google. It's called an app install ad. Let's say you have an app you want to promote. Uh, there's an easy placement you can do on Google. So it appears on YouTube, on search, uh, within other websites and so on. Facebook also has similar mobile-only placements, uh, like this one you see here. Okay? Uh, um, this, this is a different topic altogether, no? but what I'm trying to show is that there are several uh, placements that allow you to target mobile users very efficiently. Okay? Next. Fourth, second to the last, no? or I think this is the last one. Rethink behavior. This is the most important of the four that I'm mentioning. Okay? People again say, advertisers again say, no, why should I even advertise on mobile? I have a brand and it deserves to be blown up on a TV screen or a big billboard. Okay? And on a mobile device, 
if you show an ad there, it's so small, people won't remember it. Okay? Again, I beg to differ. Here's a screenshot of uh, a search ad for Nioxin. So Nioxin is a, a hair loss product that uh, we sell on hairmanila.com. Okay? If you search for Nioxin on Google on desktop, what you'll see is that uh, Hair Manila has two sets of ads. This ad on the top is called the uh, shopping ad. And this ad at the bottom is called a search ad. If you notice, if you do your digital marketing well, your ads fill up the whole screen practically. No? Uh, and I'm always on top. Okay? But if you go to mobile, and because the screen is so small, the screen is actually biased towards more of the advertising. No? So if you notice, the same ads, the shopping ads and the search ads now cover 100% of the screen. Okay? So uh, what I'd like to point out here is that uh, when people search for something, there's an even bigger chance that there's less clutter when you're doing your advertising properly. Right? So uh, I usually respond, sure, mobile is a smaller screen, but you have much, much more share of the attention of the customer. Okay? Uh, it's like comparing a, uh, let's say, a classified ad in Manila Bulletin, which is so tiny, you see, compared to a theater ad, you know, where you have a long ad and it gets 100% of your attention when you're in a cinema. You know? uh, it again boils down to that. You know, how much share of attention do you get? And on mobile, it's much higher. Okay? So to review everything, and I'd like to show this before I show last video, when you're doing mobile marketing, you have to rethink several things. You know? Number one is rethink the way that you conduct marketing as a whole. It's no longer about who has the most uh, attention or who has the most money, who wins. Rather, it's the one who has the best targeting and the best data. Meaning, can you target moments when people are actually considering you? Okay? Second, don't even consider mobile marketing or advertising if your assets aren't mobile only. Meaning, if you're a bank, does your, does your website uh, support online banking properly? Third, don't be afraid to target mobile customers because they're actually very valuable, especially iPhone customers. Okay? And fourth, um, don't assume you know how people uh, behave on mobile just because um, of your experience. No? We're seeing a new generation of customers who use the internet only on their mobile phones. No? They don't have laptops, they don't have tablets. For them, their phone is everything. They do shopping there, they do research there. Uh, I even know some people who conduct their business completely on WhatsApp. No, they manage their teams, they share files, etc., uh, etc., et completely on a messaging app because of mobile devices. Okay? So the challenge to you as a marketer or business person is, is to now think, no, what if your market was mobile only? How will that change the way you do things? Okay? So with that, I'd like to show you one last video. Uh, just to show you that what I just discussed isn't just science fiction. No? If you look at the way that China uses the internet, it actually is quite scary, but it shows you the possibilities of what could be done using just a mobile device. No? So I'll play this video now. It's six minutes long, but I'll cut it somewhere in half. If you are sitting in the United States or Europe right now, you probably never used a Chinese app. But the reality is, if you want to know how the internet will develop, China, the land once known for its cheap ripoffs, has actually become a guide to the future. But for China, the internet is more like an intranet. It's largely walled off from the Western world by this incredibly complex system of filters and blocks that we call the Great Firewall. And basically, the Great Firewall blocks any foreign site the Communist Party doesn't think it can control. So that means there is no Facebook, no Twitter, no Google. Instead, what filled the internet vacuum was a generation of Chinese copycats that have grown into huge companies. So for Google, you had Baidu. For YouTube, you had Yoku. For Twitter, you had Sina Weibo. And the list goes on and on. It's almost as if the Chinese internet is a lagoon as an aside to the greater ocean of the internet. And in that lagoon, there are these swamp monster apps that bear some resemblance to the creatures in the ocean but are mutated in some ways because they evolved in a different kind of environment. 
but things have started to shift in the sense that before no one outside of the lagoon really cared about the swamp monsters. But now all of a sudden, some of the features they've developed are so amazing that Western apps are trying to copy them. And the greatest example of this is WeChat. WeChat is an example of, uh, for lack of a better word, a super app. It's a Swiss army knife that basically does everything for you. It's your WhatsApp, Facebook, Skype, and Uber. It's your Amazon, Instagram, Venmo, and Tinder. But it's other things we don't even have apps for. There are hospitals that have built out whole appointment booking systems. There are investment services. There are even heat maps that show how crowded a place is, be it your favorite shopping mall or a popular tourist site. The list of services goes on basically forever. But it's not a variety of things you can do on WeChat that makes it so powerful. It's the fact that they're all in one app. So why does that matter? Hypothetically, imagine you're sitting at home and one day you notice your corgi is dirty. You open WeChat, hit a few buttons, and a few hours later a man shows up at your door with some shampoo and a big vacuum. Your dog gets cleaned and he looks cool. You take a photo, you share it with your friends, and tag the dog cleaning business. You haven't left the app. Your friend who likes Hello Kitty and works a boring office job is slacking off at work and looking at WeChat. She sees the photo of your clean corgi. She decides she wants her poodle clean. She clicks the tag on your photo and orders the same service. Within seconds, the man with the big vacuum is on his way to her house. She pays him, and he's happy because he got paid instantly on WeChat. She starts chatting with you to thank you. Neither of you have left the app. While chatting, she tells you about a new hip noodle joint. She says, you have to come. It's a schlep, but you accept. She orders food while still at her desk. You order a taxi. She pays for the food. On the way to her house, the man with the big vacuum invests the money he earned from both of you into a wealth management product that's probably a little too risky. Neither of you nor the man with the big vacuum have left the app. Both of you arrive and the app tells the kitchen you're there. Your WeChat profile photo pops up on the wall. It's an old photo from the year you had that weird part in your head. Of course she makes a comment. Your food is served. You notice your meat is a bit overcooked, so you snap a photo and post a disparaging restaurant review. You're already on your phone and you remember you still owe your friend money because she paid to transfer her money. Neither of you, the man with the big vacuum, nor the restaurant have left the app. At the restaurant, there are no menus, there are no waiters, there is no cashier. There is only WeChat. Okay. By so, so many functions, I'll stop this now so it's a bit longer. But it, I think it shows you just how much you can do on mobile. And in countries like China, uh, even you can see this in apps like Grab. Uh, they're now trying to be an all-in-one app where you can get a car, where you can buy things, where you can send money and so on. Uh, and it's really changing the way that we use the internet. You know? So in China, people do not use Google Chrome. They let that sink in. No? In China, when people try to book a flight or use banking or reserve uh, a cinema slot or a, a restaurant booking or even when they pay money, they do not use a mobile browser. Most of the time, they do it within WeChat. Okay? And I think Personally, that's the way that we are, that's the direction that all mobile devices are going to. Eventually, um, I think there will be dominant ecosystems like WeChat or Grab or what have you, where people will now conduct everything. Okay, so just, uh, just something to chew on. Okay, so with that, uh, sorry, I took a little longer than usual, um, than expected. So I, I think I'm 10 minutes over time, no, but, um, that's really uh, what I think about mobile marketing. Okay, so bong Q and A. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, guys, can we just? I request you to just uh, turn on your video so that Jonathan sees the class. Uh, this is a very dynamic and uh, experienced class. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're all in different places. So, guys, let's give Jonathan our appreciation for. Uh, sorry, I haven't turned my video. Appreciation for a very interesting uh, and uh, insightful presentation. So, um, again, yeah. guys, yeah. sorry, it was a bit uh, rushed. Huh? We only had 20, 30 minutes, eh? but yes, it's usually yes. much longer. Yes. Um, yeah, but I, I think the, the, the best part is this QA because now you have a chance to ask uh, questions which are relevant to you. Okay, so Jonathan has a few more minutes because he has a, an appointment at three. So, guys, anybody who has a question 
um, just turn on your mic and Jonathan will surely give a very interesting and uh, uh, direct to the point answer. So just uh, anybody? And, and maybe you can introduce uh, yourself or what you do uh, so to put the, your question in context, if, if, it, if that's necessary. Oh. Anybody? Suddenly shy when you have an expert in front of you. Oh, Anthony. Yes. Hi, uh, Jonathan. Thank you for Hi. that uh, very informative um, uh, talk that you have given us. I just like to, uh, I'm just curious. I'm not really into digital world right now. Um, I'm a practitioner for security and safety uh, in Emerson my 11th year now and um, being in this profession for 25 years you think our uh, infrastructure in terms of network in terms of um, you know the kind of uh, speed of the internet that we have are we ready to really uh, adapt that kind of mobile technology that you are uh, envisioning or that you are trying to uh, promote right now can we really uh, be able to at least uh, cope up with the kind of requirements or users or even those marketing uh, companies uh, like what they are doing in China. Are we ready yes. for that? Good question. So I'd like to cite two examples. No? No, the first one is Indonesia. So in Indonesia, uh, the share of internet economy of the entire GDP is double that of the Philippines. No, so the Philippines if you add up all of Lazada, Grab, uh, Zalora, all the internet companies, you know, that's just 1.6% of our GDP. In Indonesia, it's 3.2%, if I'm not mistaken. And the infrastructure in Indonesia is even worse than the Philippines. And they have a population three times as big. Okay, so if they can do it, there's no reason for us not to do it. Okay, the challenge now is, I think we're solving the connectivity issue. You know, with the third telco coming in, with Smart and Google ta coming up with free Wi-Fi across the nation within the next two years. No? I think connectivity is not an issue. The next challenge now would be two things. No? Number one is financial inclusion, meaning is there easy ways for customers to pay okay, and transfer money? That's the first. Second is logistics. It's so hard to get e-commerce done in the Philippines to send items from one end of the country to the other, to the other and be able to securely and uh, make sure that you, you deliver what you're doing. No? So I'm sure most of you, especially if you're not in Luzon, will have uh, horrible experiences with e-commerce just because the logistics is not up to par yet with what Indonesia is doing. Okay, so that's one. So look up the examples of e-commerce and mobile marketing in Indonesia. They are very, very good. Uh, in fact, they are, I think, two years ahead of everybody in the region. No, especially if you if you go to Jakarta and you try to order something, no, they're very very good. Okay, but second, I'd like to point out um, an even more uh, simple solution. Now, if you're familiar with something called M Pesa, M letter M P E S A. Okay, M Pesa is a mobile currency that started in Africa. Then what it is basically is an SMS based wallet. So in some parts of Africa, it's too dangerous to carry physical money. Okay? Or sometimes um, the, the inflation rate is so high that it becomes, like if you look at, I think it's Zimbabwe, no? it becomes useless to really carry, let's say, 100 pesos because tomorrow that 100 pesos can be worth 50 pesos. Okay? So a lot of telcos in Kenya, I think it started in Kenya, if I'm not mistaken, started doing digital currency and this was like 10 years ago no sms based it's like load it's like mobile load it's like smart money or gcash okay you are now able to store value in a mobile and sms based uh uh wallet okay if they could do it with sms and feature based phones there's no reason we can't do transactions and commerce okay so it's all about behavior i would say it's not about technology it's more about behavior uh, if there is money to be made, then uh, people will change their behavior. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so there's two things, Indonesia and uh, Africa, M-Pesa and e-commerce in Indonesia.
But good question. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Just to add, it's not just consumers changing behavior. It's even merchants changing behavior as far as uh, their willingness to take risks. For example, on deliveries, to accept cash on delivery, right? Uh, yeah. Just because they know that, again, there's a lot who will be included if you allow that feature of cash on delivery. I don't know the latest rates as far as bad orders are concerned for COD, but I think it's worth it because it's, it's more and more accepted, again, by the merchants because uh, they're yeah. in the, the averages and they win based on the average. Is that, is that a correct assessment, Johnson? Yeah, 60 to 70 percent of all e-commerce transactions are COD based. Okay. In the Philippines, India, it's like 80 to 90 percent. Okay. And and again, once you get used to uh, what apps or tools like GCash, suddenly from zero percent you can ship 100 percent of your transactions to all of that because it's just so convenient and problem solving. So it will suddenly. Here's here's a fun fact. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Jonathan, yes, fun fact, please. Here's a fun fact. In China, uh, you have something called Alipay, Alibaba. So they have an Alipay wallet. No? Um, did you know that Alipay is now the biggest bank in China, one of the biggest banks in China? <laughs> because they started offering interest rates. So if you're familiar with Gcash, I think Gcash is offering a 1%, 2% interest rate if you keep money with them. No, they don't say it's interest, but effectively it's interest. It's it's you're growing your cash. No? In China, they have that as well. So instead of putting your money in a mutual fund or a UITF, there's an option for you to keep it in your wallet where it grows at a certain interest rate. Okay, so again, it's, it's the way that um, mobile and technology is redefining how business is conducted. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just to share on mobile, <coughs> with Touch ID more and more possible using smartphones. You don't even need to put in passwords and because of the one-time pins, you just feel so confident that the transaction is secure. Uh, yeah. The internet, you're not. Uh, just to share. Yes. Uh, I just, so there are two uh, online banks, mobile banks now that just launched this year. One of them is CIMB, other is ING. So yeah. I just signed up for ING. Um, you don't have, I, I, I created a savings account without even going to a bank. Now, it's been around for some time in Southeast Asia, but you just take a picture of yourself with a selfie, with a passport or whatever. And eventually, you can now start depositing checks just by taking a picture of your check front and back. Then it earns 2% interest on a savings account, which is higher, much, much higher than a time deposit. Okay? And there's zero transfer fees to other banks. So imagine I don't have to line up at BPI anymore because BPI takes me an hour to deposit one check. Now I just take a picture and next day it's cleared. I can transfer it to my savings account and BPI to pay my bills and so on. But more importantly, it earns me 2% interest rate compared to a 0.25% in a savings account in a, norm, in a normal bank. Uh, 8x return. Yeah. Um, no brainer. Just to comment uh, on and uh, sure. follow up with the question. Uh, I came from Ethiopia, a neighborhood country from Kenya, so I know yes, yes, yes. Uh, did, uh, in Kenya it's a very good uh, payment system, yes. which allowed uh, you know those who are uh, who don't have a banking coverage uh, to to have a payment system. So they use their mobile to to transact and to trade their crops and uh, uh, their cattle. With, with the urban dwellers, so it's, it's a very good breakthrough that happened in Africa. But with the growth of the mobile technology and with all this uh, uh, transformation uh, into mobile, yes. how do you see the, the digital currency technologies which we hear coming up, like the bitcoins and others, affecting the, uh, this uh, this uh, technology in the okay. future. Okay. So, first of all, thank you for um, giving your feedback on Mpesa. Um, I've always heard about it in theory, but not from somebody who's familiar with it. But I'm familiar with one of the tech companies here in the Philippines who helped set up the Mpesa network uh, when, when 10 years ago, I think, uh, back in Kenya. But yeah, 
um, to your question about cryptocurrency, okay? So, it I think you have you can't talk about cryptocurrency without separating the technology from the speculation. Okay? So, uh, me like most people uh, lost some money in the Bitcoin crash of January 2018. Okay. Um, but it's because of speculation. Speculation. There was a bubble, yeah, and then looking back, it was a bubble. Uh, there were a few enterprising individuals who helped pump and dump the price by hyping uh, Bitcoin as an investment. Okay? Personally, I don't think Bitcoin can recover uh, unless there is a certain growth in people using it for actual purchases. No, uh, until the point where I can buy coffee with Bitcoin, it's not going to increase in usage. And if the usage doesn't increase, the value won't increase. Right? Similar to USD. Okay? USD's value is so high because the trade is is very, very like everybody practically accepts USD. Even Cambodia or Vietnam accept USD in some locations. No? Okay. That being said, the technology behind Bitcoin is called blockchain. Blockchain is a way of decentralizing transactions in such a way that you don't need a central authority. And I believe in that. Uh, if you could clear checks without the BSP, the central bank, uh, waiting for you to actually uh, say this check is cleared. You know? If I could sell a property without going through the BIR, the Internal Revenue Service, or the... Uh, what do you call this? Civil registry, okay. And both buyer and seller are guaranteed that one one is authentic and the second will receive their money. I think that's a very big way of changing the way that people do business. So blockchain, yes, uh, specifically for certain things, uh, certain verticals. Like number one is real estate. Okay. What if? And I think this is something that's going to develop this year. No. What if you could issue a security token? A security token is basically ownership of an asset or a future stream of cash flow, okay? Uh, similar to a stock or a rate or a REIT or a fractional ownership of, a, of an asset. You know? Suddenly, I'm not bound by liquidity. Suddenly, if I invest in a company, as long as there's a willing seller, somebody can buy my stock. Second, I'm not limited by geolocation. Okay? If you invest in a Filipino company, you have no choice but to buy stock in the Philippine Stock Exchange. Okay? Suddenly, if I have, let's say, I'm setting up a new condo or uh, I'm setting a work of art or I'm, selling a, I'm setting up a new startup, using security tokens based on blockchain, essentially, I can now do fractional ownership of assets and sell that to people all around the world as long as they're willing to pay my price. Right? So in theory... In theory, and I think um, it, a lot of this depends on the SECs of different countries. No, I think blockchain is a very uh, solid technology to help assets and wealth and value uh, be transacted over like mar several markets to create a global market. No, but Bitcoin per se, Ethereum per se, Ripple per se, not too sure. It depends on the adoption and how big their network is. No? So. Be, I mean, caveat emptor, right? I mean, do your, do your due diligence when you choose to invest. But for me, I'd rather build on the technology. Okay. Guys, I, I'm very conscious of um, Jonathan's awesome time. Um, I'd just like to get Jonathan's reaction to this insight of mine or theory of mine. Sure. That digital tools, digital technologies are changing so fast. Basically, what we have to do is first to know that they're there. Just be aware that they're there. For the simple ones, we want to use them, to apply them, to, to maybe do it ourselves. But we can never expect to be experts at it. So if you need mobile experts or Google AdWords experts, don't try to do it yourself. It's just too long. It's just too expensive to learn from your own mistakes. Uh, so any reaction to that? To that um, thinking, Jonathan. Yes and yes and no. So for for technical stuff, development, I don't do it myself. Okay. No, so I don't know. I don't have the time to study new languages uh, from scratch. No, I only know my basic HTML. I don't. I don't program. I okay. know what I learned in high school and college. No, so I make sure that I work with the best developers in the field. Okay. However, when it comes to advertising, Facebook, Google, uh, 
Twitter or all these different things, usually the cost of entry is so cheap or the cost of entry is so small, like you can set up a Facebook campaign with a credit card, that it becomes negligible in terms of opportunity cost. No? So it actually begs to differ in terms of marketing. Okay? Um, there is an, an opportunity to do it yourself. And a lot of the biggest e-commerce sellers that I know, no, uh, some of them started out with an experiment. And over time, they learned it on the go. And eventually, they hired people once it became too big. No, but if you're starting out with a small business, it becomes more expensive to hire or outsource than to try it yourself. So, yes and no. For technical, yes, hire the best. For marketing, it's cheap to try. Okay. So, so you're commenting based on doing Facebook marketing, which actually this class will be doing next week. No? They'll be reporting yes. their own Facebook campaigns. But even Google AdWords, would you consider that as too technical for no. the average Joe? Yes, uh, there is a new pro uh, there's a new uh, website that Google launched called AdWords Express. So it's a very simplified version of AdWords where it's similar to Facebook now. Uh, it's not just marketed. It's not, Google isn't promoting it as, as well as they should, but it's focused towards small businesses who do not have the time or the technical capability to do AdWords completely, uh, the professional way. Right? So AdWords Express, uh, it's, it's a site where you just type in your website's address and pick which vertical you're in, like hair salons or uh, hardware, and it will write your ads for you. Okay. So, okay, so yeah. It, it's becoming simpler and simpler over time. Okay, okay. And again, Google set it up just so to get more people to do it themselves, right? Yes. Just to and it uses machine learning to automate things. So um, if 10 years ago, people had to write every single keyword, every single ad, okay? Google now has artificial intelligence or more of machine learning so that Google can scan your website, pick out the keywords you want to advertise on, write the ad for you, and do the targeting for you as well. So all you have to do is put your credit card in, make sure the ads are accurate, and then launch it. Okay. okay. Uh, so the performance won't be as good as if a professional was doing it, but it's so cheap that it doesn't hurt to try. All right. Give Jonathan again our round of applause online. Thanks, Bong. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, the, sure. And and I'm sure if they need you, they will find you somewhere. Yes. So <laughs> I'll send the deck link to you okay. so that the, my email address is on the very last slide. Okay. If you have any questions uh, that I can help out with, uh, I'll, sure to, I'll be sure to reply. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Bob. Bye. Bye. Wise words indeed from an award-winning digital marketing professional, Jonathan Hawson, who was recognized as Southeast Asia's Asia Planner of the Year. So if you have questions for Jonathan, you can contact him at jonathanhawson at gmail.com. And one more thing, if you found value in this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, connect through my blog or through LinkedIn, so together, we can serve. Thank you.